Well, thanks everyone for coming. And I think we're gonna have some fun tonight. I'm talking about the history of climate change science. I'm gonna profile 10 individuals um, who made major contributions to this field. And I'm going to use um, the discussion of their contributions sort of as a jumping off point to talk about some of the science issues, uh, perhaps some that I don't have a chance to often talk about. Um, can I ask everyone to mute their screen or sorry, mute their microphones, please? And then we'll jump right in here. Well, it all began with Joseph Fourier. Yes, that Joseph Fourier, the famous French mathematician. He was scientific advisor to Napoleon. And of course, he's the guy who developed the Fourier series of mathematics. If you've ever studied uh, engineering or science, you're very familiar with Fourier series. But he was also a physicist. He worked on analytic theory of heat flow. And in the 1820s, you know, that's uh, 200 years ago, he became the first to hypothesize that the atmosphere warms the Earth by trapping infrared radiation. Um, he looked at the sun, he looked at the Earth, and he pretty quickly came to the conclusion that the Earth should be much, much colder than it is. And the only reason it's as warm as it is is because there must be some trapping of infrared radiation going on. He said that must be happening in the atmosphere. So he was thus the first to propose the greenhouse effect, though he never used that term. The person who first used the term greenhouse effect was, in fact, John Henry Poynting. He's a famous uh, uh, physicist who worked in electricity and magnetism. Um, there's the Poynting vector of electricity and magnetism named after him. But he also got interested in climate. And he published a paper in 1909 where he used the term greenhouse effect and talked about the analogy of a greenhouse to the atmosphere. And I'll have a little more to say about that later on. Now, the second person in this story is someone you've probably never heard of. I only heard of her just very recently. That's Eunice Newton Foote. She was an American scientist, inventor, and women's rights champion. Um, she did the very first experiment on the warming effect of sunlight on different gases. And based on these experiments, she became the first, the first, to theorize that increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would warm the Earth. Now, her experimental setup was very simple. She had these glass globes and she put different gases in them and, and a thermometer and she put them out in the sunlight and saw how much they warmed up. Uh, not a perfect experiment. Uh, some of the reason why the different gases warmed up was not because of a trapping effect of the greenhouse effect, but rather uh, a heating effect in the way that uh, the different gases absorb sunlight. So it wasn't a perfect experimental setup, but nevertheless, she was the first to say carbon dioxide is special. It's doing something here. And in fact, here's a direct quote from her 1856 paper, four years before the Civil War. And it's, quote, an atmosphere of, of that gas, CO2, would give to our Earth a high temperature. And if, as some suppose, at one period of its history, the air had mixed with it a larger proportion than at present, an increased temperature must necessarily have resulted. So not only did she identify CO2 as an important greenhouse gas, the first to do that, but she was also the first to speculate that paleoclimate would have been affected by carbon dioxide. Indeed, we know that the ice age cycle is, is amplified by the carbon dioxide feedback effect. She was really the first person to speculate along those lines. Unfortunately, her work was largely overlooked by those who followed, and she never received the recognition she deserved until very recently. Her work has been discovered and she's been publicized. Sad commentary, save affairs back then. Um, her paper was presented at an American Association of Science meeting in Boston in 1856, but she was not allowed to present it. it had to be presented by uh, a male colleague. Uh, it was an old boys club then and they didn't allow women in. So she had to actually call on somebody else to present her paper. And the paper was pretty much overlooked by, by the rest of the, of the scientific community, which is unfortunate. The person who is generally credited as being the first one to, to uh, uh, investigate CO2 was the renowned Irish phys physicist, John Tyndall. Uh, Tyndall made many fun fundamental contributions to the understanding of electricity, magnetism, radiant heat flow. And he proved Fourier's hypothesis that the Earth's atmosphere warms 
uh, the Earth by measuring the infrared absorbing properties of atmospheric gases in the laboratory. And he showed that water vapor absorbs the most infrared radiation in the atmosphere of all the gases, but also noted the importance of CO2. Now, he was either unaware of Eunice Newton Foote's earlier work on this subject, or he chose to ignore it. I'm hoping it was the former and not the latter. In any case, it's really fun to look at his experimental setup. And here's a, actually a picture from his original paper. <clears throat> and I'm going to try to explain how this works. I'm sure I'm not going to be 100% right, but it's still kind of fun to talk about it. And it's like this. There is this tube right here into which he introduced the different gases. Now, the tube had on it at each end a plug made out of rock salt. Rock salt was known to be transparent to infrared radiation, but it held the gas in. And he had, he had pumps and ways of evacuating the gas from this tube to make a vacuum and then putting various gases in there. He had two heat sources, one right here and one right there. Think of that as being like a Bunsen burner. And it's warming up some type of a radiator here, which might have been made of metal or perhaps ceramic. Two identical setups on both side, <clears throat> sides. And the idea was <clears throat> the, um, the radiant heat from this end of the tube, the, the infrared radiation would flow through the tube and be affected by whatever was, was in it. And then it would be collected by this horn here and it would come to the middle. And then there would be the same thing coming from the other side and in the middle here was a thermal pile, which is like a, is, is like a connection of, of thermocouples, which measure temperature difference. So if the same amount of radiation was coming from both sides, then there would be a, a zero uh, flow of electricity here, which he then measured on a galvanometer down here. So I think the way he probably did this was he probably did a calibration state experiment where he evacuated all the gas out of here, all the air out of here, and that would have been a vacuum. And then he read whatever voltage was registering here through the galvanometer and this thermal pile. That would be sort of like his baseline. And then he would have loaded up the tube with uh, nitrogen, which is the most common uh, element in the atmosphere. Repeated the experiment, he would have seen the same reading because nitrogen is not absorbing infrared radiation. Then he would have tried perhaps oxygen. And again, it would behave just like having a, just like having a, um, a vacuum there because oxygen doesn't absorb infrared radiation. Then he tried CO2 and lo and behold, there was a big signal. There was, it was much colder on this side than on that side because the CO2 was being absorbed here. And he also tried ultimately water vapor and he showed the same thing. So he was able to identify that water vapor and CO2 are the most important um, uh, in, uh, greenhouse gases for trapping this radiation and warming the earth in just the manner that Joseph Foy had speculated about. So that was a pretty pretty major contribution. Uh, he did this work, published this paper three years after the work of Eunice Newton Foote, a year before the Civil War. So that kind of shows you how far back that was going on. Now the next person in this saga is uh, Svante Arrhenius. Many people have called Arrhenius the, the father of climate change. He made enormous contributions. He was a Nobel Prize winning Swedish chemist. He made fundamental contributions in many areas of science. In fact, he was uh, seen as the uh, one of the uh, founders of physical, physical chemistry. In 1896, he was the first to calculate the warming of the earth due to increasing atmospheric CO2, and most importantly, the first to conclude that human-caused CO2 emissions from the burning of fossil fuels were large enough to cause global warming. He quantified uh, the effect of greenhouse gases on warming the Earth. And he also developed uh, this kind of a theoretical way. He showed that for each doubling of the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, the Earth would warm by the same fixed amount after reaching equilibrium in about a century. And that fixed amount of warming and equilibrium for each doubling has become known as the Equilibrium Climate Sensitivity, ECS. And that's an important parameter that people still talk about today quite a bit. It's often used to characterize different models. The higher the ECS for a particular model, the more sensitive it is to increasing CO2, the more warming it's going to predict. So enormous contributions here. And before I move on, uh, one fun fact you're going to really enjoy. And that is the fact that um, Greta Thunberg, our, our friend Greta Thunberg, in fact, is a direct descendant of Svante Arrhenius. In fact, uh, Greta Thunberg's father is named Svante in Arrhenius's uh, honor. Uh, 
And I think that um, the way this goes is that Arrhenius was Greta Thunberg's great, 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 great grandfather, plus or minus one great, uh, so direct descendant. So that's kind of a fun thing to, to be aware of. So let's talk a little bit about the greenhouse effect. Before I go a little bit farther, I, I just want to mention something, and that is, you know, the term greenhouse is a really good analogy for the way the system works, but it's not a perfect analogy. And I think we all should, you know, think about that and be aware of that. You know, a greenhouse works is the sun comes through the glass and then it strikes the inside of the greenhouse that warms up. And yes, indeed, the glass traps the outgoing infrared radiation, just like greenhouse gases trap outgoing infrared radiation in the Earth's atmosphere. So that's very analogous. But a greenhouse also warms up to a great extent because it traps hot air. It traps hot air inside. And of course, that doesn't happen in our atmosphere. Hot air just rises. And you can prove that to yourself anytime you uh, close up your car on a hot day. You know that if you roll the windows all the way up and you go out and come back, it's really, really hot inside. On the other hand, if you crack the windows a little bit, allow some of that hot air to go out, cool air to come back, it makes the inside of the car much cooler. And that's because to a great extent, you know, the greenhouse effect also involves trapping of hot air. And of course, the Earth's greenhouse effect does not involve that. But anyway, uh, the greenhouse effect works like this. The Earth is warmed by incoming solar radiation and it's cooled by reflected solar radiation and outgoing long wave radiation, also known as infrared radiation. And the greenhouse gases shown here in this shaded area trap the outgoing long wave radiation and warm the lower atmosphere and the surface of the Earth. And of course, human activities increase greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and increase the warming. So what are the greenhouse gases? Well, kind of an order of importance here. Water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, defluorinated gases, also sometimes referred to as the halogenated gases, nitrous oxide, and ozone. Note that I've colored water vapor and ozone differently, and that's because they're kind of special. Water vapor contributes to global warming through the water vapor feedback loop. As the atmosphere gets, as the oceans get warmer, the atmosphere gets warmer, uh, more water vapor is in the atmosphere. The atmosphere getting, is getting more humid, and so it's trapping more heat. That's a positive feedback effect, but it's not a driving effect. Water vapor does not drive global warming, but it does amplify global warming through the water vapor feedback effect. The important thing to know about water vapor is it is in balance with the natural hydrological cycle. And it also has a short residency time in the atmosphere. If you put a bunch of water vapor in the atmosphere, well, within a matter of a few days, it's going to rain out if it's out of balance with the hydrologic cycle. So water vapor does not drive global warming. What about ozone? We hardly ever talk about ozone. Let's talk about ozone a little bit here. Ozone molecule by molecule is a powerful greenhouse gas. Uh, ozone is very resonant with the photons of infrared radiation, and thus it, it captures infrared radi radiation very effectively. But its contributions to, to global warming are actually not that large. And to understand that, we have to realize that ozone exists in two areas in the atmosphere. First of all, there's the stratospheric ozone, and that's residing up at the base of the stratosphere, about 40,000 feet in altitude. That's the famous ozone layer that we all depend on to absorb uh, ultraviolet light from the sun. Thank God we have that, otherwise you know, we'd be really in trouble. Now the thing about that a stratospheric ozone, yes, it does trap outgoing IR radiation, and that's a warming effect, but it also absorbs incoming solar radiation, particularly in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. And that's a cooling effect, and the two pretty much cancel themselves out. So the bottom line is the stratospheric ozone layer has a minimal impact on warming. The other uh, aspect of ozone is called um, tropospheric ozone or surface ozone. And that's ozone that is created mainly in big cities in the summertime. There's lots of heat, lots of sun, lots of, lots of exhaust from automobiles. Uh, that surface ozone is created intermittently as a result of chemical reactions of uh, so-called volatile uh, volatile compounds, vol volatile organic compounds in the presence of solar radiation and heat. Ozone is created, and that's why you have, you know, air pollution problems, particularly in, in big cities. There's a lot of traffic. It doesn't last very long. It's only created intermittently, and it doesn't last very long. It has a short residency time measured in days or maybe a week. Uh, 
and therefore it doesn't really make that much of a contribution to warming. Indeed, the gases that are the real culprits, these are called the so-called long-lived greenhouse gases, are the ones we're familiar with. That's carbon dioxide, methane, the fluorinated gases, and nitrous oxide. Now, I mentioned before that you know, the warming occurs in the lower part of the atmosphere and uh, at the surface, and that's a really important concept. So we're going to talk about it for a second here. This is a schematic diagram of the vertical structure of the atmosphere going from the surface up to about 75 miles in, in altitude. And there are these four layers, the troposphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, and the thermosphere. All the weather is down here in the troposphere. And just to get the point of reference, this is about where jet airliners fly, pretty near the top of the troposphere, just above the weather. The point is here, and it's very important, is that the warming that's occurring because of the greenhouse effect is occurring only way down here, where I've shaded it red, the lower half of the troposphere, from the surface up to about 20,000 feet. Every place above, it's cooling. The greenhouse effect is causing every place above to cool. Why is it cooling? Well, because the heat that would normally warm it is being trapped below. So you're, cool, you're heating the atmosphere from below, cooling it from above, and that's making the atmosphere more unstable because hot air rises, and it's that hot air rising, cold air descending, which uh, converts potential energy into kinetic energy. That's what drives storms. The atmosphere is also becoming more unstable because it's becoming more humid. It's becoming more humid because the the oceans, the rivers, the lakes are all warming up, and that's increasing their evaporation, plus the air in the atmosphere is getting warmer, it can hold more moisture, and so the atmosphere is progressively getting more humid. And that's also an instability, because when clouds form, uh, that water vapor condenses into cloud droplets and ultimately raindrops and perhaps snow crystals. That releases heat, and that heat uh, causes even further rising of the air and further uh, instability of the atmosphere. So the point is, this is this is exactly why global warming is causing increase in severe weather, uh, because as the warming proceeds, it's making the atmosphere more unstable by heating it from below and cooling it from above. We'll come back to this concept of ECS, equilibrium uh, climate sensitivity, one of the great contributions that Arrhenius made. And uh, here are a number of estimates of ECS. There's lots of different ways of estimating ECS. And you can see there's, there's a range of, of uncertainty here. But if you combine all of this, you find that ECS, at least as of 2018, the scientific consensus was it was about 3 degrees centigrade or a little bit less than 3 degrees centigrade. I'm going to have more to say about this at the end of this talk. There are some results coming out that are a bit concerning, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this. But just realize that this is, you know, a range of different ways of estimating this ECS for the Earth. And at least up until very recently, pretty strong scientific consensus that uh, the ECS of, of the world is about three, three degrees centigrade. Now, the way science progresses and makes progress is you have theory and observation coming together. You have a theory of how the world works or the universe works. You have observations. You put the two together and they support each other and that's how you make progress. Sometimes theory gets ahead of, of observations. Sometimes observations gets ahead of, of theory. At this point in the story, the theory was ahead of the observations. Arrhenius had developed this theory and he looked at things quantitatively and he had come to the conclusion that the human emissions of, of CO2 into the atmosphere caused by the, by the Industrial Revolution should make the Earth warm. But that was just a theory at that point. No one had observed that. And then along came this interesting person, Guy Stewart Calder. Now, Calder was an English steam engineer and inventor. He studied and pursued climatology as a hobby. And he was the first to analyze global temperature measurements and show that the post-industrial Earth was indeed warming, consistent with what Arrhenius had said you know, a few decades prior. Um, he concluded that this warming was a result of rising CO2 levels in the atmosphere caused by the burning of fossil fuels, just as Arrhenius had hypothesized. Now, he published his paper in 1938. And think about that, you know, he had to acquire millions of observations from all around the world. And, you know, there was no mechanism for sharing that. There was no World Meteorological Organization back then. This was before there were computers, before there were any kind of uh, 
electronic calculators. He might have had a mechanical calculator, but certainly must have had to do a lot of laborious calculations by hand. But he was able to do that. <coughs> and he was able to show that the Earth was indeed warming. Now, the part of the warming he observed was pretty much this, this upward uh, trend right here from about 1910 to um, uh, the early 40s. This is what Calendar observed, about a you know, six-tenths of a degree increase there. And that was the first time anyone had actually shown that the Earth was warming. And, and Calendar was able to show that it was warming in exact, exactly the same way that uh, Irenaeus had hypothesized. Now, um, is that warming natural or is it, you know, caused by humans? You know, what's going on there? Well, when you look at natural climate change, go look, looking back a couple of million years, um, the Ice Age cycle really dominates. The Ice Age cycle dominates um, natural climate change. And so it's important to understand what's going on with the Ice Age cycle. Well, the person who figured that out was this gentleman, Milutin Milankovic. He was a Serbian mathematician, astronomer, climatologist, geophysicist, and civil engineer. He pretty much did it all. And he discovered the role that the orbital variations of the Earth play in driving the Ice Age cycle. And that's the eccentricity cycle, obliquity cycle, precession cycle. And they have become to be known as the Milankovitch cycles and are a cornerstone of our understanding of natural climate change. So here's a picture of, of uh, global mean surface temperature of the Earth over the past 5 million years. And you can see beginning with the Pleistocene epoch about 2.5 million years ago, the Earth started experiencing these ice age cycles. And that's what these up and down swings are here. And we've been through literally dozens and dozens of ice ages. For the last million years, we've on, been on a 100,000 year ice age cycle and it kind of looks like this. So what's driving that? Well, Milankovitch showed that it was in fact these variations in the Earth's orbit around the sun, as well as variations in the Earth's uh, orientation space. Uh, this is called the eccentricity cycle. It's a hundred year cycle. It's driven by the gravitational force of Jupiter and Saturn acting on the Earth. Now this diagram is highly uh, exaggerated here. It's actually about a 1% variation. But what happens is on a hundred year cycle, the Earth's orbit varies from being more drawn out like an ellipse to less drawn out more like a circle. And it fluctuates back and forth like that. And that has, has an enormous impact on Earth's climate. This is called the obliquity cycle. As you know, the Earth's axis is inclined relative to the plane in which it orbits. That's what gives us the seasons. But it doesn't stay constant. It actually rocks back in time rocks back and forth from 24.5 degrees to 22.5 degrees. So about a two degree variation here over a 41,000 year period. And that's due to the gravitational force of the sun and moon acting on the earth. The earth is top heavy. There's a lot more land mass in the Northern hemisphere than the Southern hemisphere. And of course you go around, you know, go around uh, Meridian here. There's also variations, you know, mountain ranges and oceans and all that. So the earth is not a perfect sphere. And as the sun and the moon's gravity works on the earth, it causes this rocking back and forth. And it also causes the earth to wobble. I'm sure we all know that the North Pole points to the North Star. But um, 13,500 years from now, the North Pole is going to point towards the star of Vega. And then 13.5 million thousand years after that, it'll come back to the North Star. So the earth wobbles. And that also has an impact on, on climate. Uh, so let's talk about that a little bit more. Uh, this is a picture of global mean surface temperature of the Earth over the past 22,000 years. And um, what we're seeing here is, in fact, um, recovery from the last ice age, this warming here during the, this green colored band here. And that's driven by the eccentricity cycle. What was happening during this roughly 10,000 year period is that the Earth's orbit was becoming less drawn out like an ellipse and more flattened out like a circle. And that drove this warming till we got to uh, what's known as the Holocene uh, interglacial period, this warm period right here. For point of reference, here's the beginning of human civilization about 9,000 years ago. Notice about 7,000 years ago, the Earth started this slow cooling trend. And that, in fact, is being driven by the obliquity cycle. What's happening is the Earth has been losing tilt. In fact, over the last 7,000 years, the Earth has lost about seven-tenths of a degree of angular tilt, and that has caused this slow cooling trend here. 
And then a couple other identifiable things in this record. This is called the medieval warm period right here. This is called the Little Ice Age. And finally, we come to this red spike here, which in fact is the post-industrial global warming. And it's nice that we have Milankovitch's work because we understand all what's going on here. And we see how different this is from what has been going on here. You see how different uh, the temperature change the last 100 years is from the natural climate change. And in fact, um, the global warming of the past 120 years has been proceeding in the wrong direction. And you know, we should be still cooling. And in fact, we should continue this cooling trend for about under normal circumstances for another 8,000 years. And then it would turn down more rapidly for about 10,000 years. And, we, and we'd be in the next ice age about 18,000 years from now. But in fact, we're going abruptly in the other direction. We're going very fast, about 20 times faster in the opposite direction than natural climate change. And oh, by the way, uh, the onset of this just happens to occur exactly at the beginning of the industrial age. So pretty, pretty compelling evidence that this is not natural climate change. So there was a world war. And then in the post-World War, uh, World War II era, climate science uh, came back to the forefront again. And the person who made uh, some of the most important contributions in the early part of that era was a Russian by the name of Mikhail Budiko. So Budiko was a Russian climatologist and one of the founders of physical climatology. He pioneered the development of simple models of the Earth's climate based on global radiative heat balance. His groundbreaking book, Heat Balance of the Earth's Surface, was published in 1956, and it transformed climatology from a mostly qualitative science into a quantitative physical science. He, for example, was the first to describe and quantify the snow ice feedback effect and Arctic amplification of global warming. Um, and also the long-term predictions of global warming and sea ice loss produced by, by Medico in the early 70s with his simple radiative heat balance models have proved to be remarkably accurate. Realized it when he was doing this, this is before we had supercomputers, before we had the climate models we're familiar with today. He was using very simple radiative balance models uh, and he was able to make forecasts and in fact uh, have verified quite well in terms of how much ice has been lost in the Arctic and that sort of thing. So Badiko was focused on you know, things that look like this, this idea of this radiative heat balance that, we've, that I often show. And I want to use this as a jumping off point to talk about a very important term and a very important concept, and that is radiative forcing. You'll probably hear that term. You'll probably read that term, radiative forcing now in time. I want to make sure you understand what it is. Although there's a more um, precise definition, basically it's just essentially the, the radiation balance at the top of the atmosphere. So, you know, you have out, you have reflected solar radiation going out, you have long wave radiation going out, you have incoming solar radiation. You just add those all together and you end up with this number down here, uh, plus 0 0.9 watts per square meter. That is the radiative forcing. If the radiative forcing, which is basically the sum of these numbers here, sums to zero, then the Earth is neither warming nor cooling. If it's positive, then the Earth has got to be warming. If it's negative, then the Earth's got to be cooling. If that doesn't happen, then we're violating conservation of energy. It's just got to happen. So radiative forcing is an important concept. It's basically the radiation balance at the top of the atmosphere. And you can also break the radiative forcing into individual components, which is quite mm -hmm. instructive. And the way that's usually presented is a change in the key components of the radiative forcing from 1750, which is the pre-industrial era, to the current time. The reason we have to, to do it that way, look at a change, is because individual components here were non-zero, even in the pre-industrial era, they summed to zero, but individual components were non-zero. And what we really want to see is how have things changed between then and now. In other words, what has been the impact of, of man on radiative forcing? What has been the impact of, of natural variability on that? So what we have here in the upper part here are different components of the radiative forcing. And you can see the, the effect of the, of the four um, long-lived uh, greenhouse gases, halogenated gases here, or, or F gases. And right off the bat, you see that in fact, carbon dioxide is the dominant greenhouse gas. Now, the way we read this chart is the dot here is the most likely value, and these are error bars, so there's some uncertainty here. But if you take the most likely value, and you can come down here, you're seeing that uh, it's green out, CO2 alone is producing warming of about, about 1.3 uh, watts per square meter. That's the measurement of, of, of radiation, watts per square meter flux of energy. 
Next, next comes methane, halogenated gases down here and nitrous oxide finally down there. And then there are some short-lived gases that affect ozone, don't have that much of an impact. You sum these all together, pretty much uh, sum to zero. Then we have to talk about aerosols. Aerosols exert a cooling effect, and we always mention that, but black carbon, also known as soot, actually exerts a warming effect. So the black carbon in the atmosphere actually does absorb enough sun that it actually warms the atmosphere. But on balance, we look at all the different aerosols, um, they do produce, in fact, a, cool, a net cooling effect. Changes in clouds due to aerosols. As we put aerosols in the atmosphere, air pollution, for example, that's actually seeding clouds and, and increasing cloudiness, and that cloudiness is reflecting solar radiation away, and that exerts a cooling effect. This is kind of interesting. Change in albedo due to land use. What's going on here? Well, you know, when we, we take down a forest, deforestation, that's bad, of course, because that's increasing the CO2 that goes into the atmosphere, but there is actually a cooling effect associated with that. It's, it's small, but it's not zero. And that is when you, when you, it turns out forests are very dark. They absorb a lot of solar radiation. If you deforest and end up having grasslands or croplands or even bare soil, it's more reflective than the forest. And so that solar radiation is reflected out and that's a, a slight cooling effect. And then finally, uh, change in energy from the sun. Look how small that is. You know, one of the favorite climate denier theories is, well, it's the sun. You know, we can't do anything about the sun, so quit bothering me, it's just the sun. Well, no, it's not. Here's, here's how much the sun has changed uh, since 1750. Very, very small warming effect, very close to zero. So when you sum all this together, you come out with this value right here, which is 2.3 watts per square meter. Sum all these together, you come out with a warming of 2.3 watts per square meter as the rate of forcing. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, you say. That can't be right because, look, you just showed me it was 0.9 watts per square meter, and now you're saying 2.3 watts per square meter. You might be thinking of that line, that Jack Nicholson line from the movie The Shining. Professor, what the hell is going on here? Well, I'm going to explain. And that is there's an, there's an important component that's missing here that's not shown in this table and not, not summed up here. And that, in fact, is the um, long wave radio feedback, the, the fact that the Earth, as it's warmed, it's radiating more from the surface. And there is this famous Stefan Boltzmann law, which is kind of summarized here, and that says that the outgoing long wave radiation from the surface of the Earth is proportional to the absolute temperature of the Earth to the fourth power. So the absolute temperature of the Earth is measured in degrees Kelvin is, is um, just like the, the centigrade scale, the Kelvin scale is just like the centigrade scale, except zero is at absolute zero, which is minus 273 degrees uh, uh, centigrade. So if you have the Earth's temperature in centigrade, you just add 273 to it and you have it in, then in Kelvin. And the outgoing solar radiate or outgoing long wave radiation will increase in proportion to the fourth power of that. So as the Earth has warmed about 1.2 degrees centigrade um, over the past uh, you know, 120 years or so, the outgoing long wave radiation has increased by about 1.5 watts per square meter. That's a, a negative feedback effect. It's trying to cool the Earth down, thank goodness, because if it wasn't for that, we would be about three times warmer than we are now. We would be in excess of three degrees above uh, pre-industrial right now. And we'd be heading for probably nine degrees of warming by the end of this century. But thanks, Thanks to this long wave radio feedback effect, the fact that as the Earth warms up, it tries to cool back down, uh, that's constrained that. And that explains that discrepancy between here. You'll, you'll typically see you, you know, that long wave uh, feedback effect not shown on these charts. And therefore, you know, you'll see a number here that's not consistent with the actual radio, total radio forcing. Total radio forcing is about 0 0.9 point. Some people now are saying 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, maybe approaching one. It's kind of in that range watts per square meter. And realize that that's averaged over the entire face of the Earth, average over day and night, average over all four seasons. So when you sum that up, and I've done that in some of my other talks, you may have seen it, it's really a huge amount of heat. And uh, of course, as we've probably talked about before, in most of that heat, 95% of it is going into the oceans. And there's a lot of implications about that. Uh, Bidiko also was the person who um, 
uh, first talked about and quantified the snow ice feedback effect. This is a very important positive feedback effect that amplifies global warming. As uh, global temperatures are increasing, that decreases snow and ice, and that, of course, increases the sunlight absorbed by land and sea. Ice is, is, has some of the highest, well, ice, has, ice and snow have the highest albedos of any place on the Earth. And ocean actually has the lowest. You know, ocean is very dark. And so when you melt sea ice and, and all of a sudden the sun is impinging on, on the ocean, it really warms much faster because that, sun, that, that solar radiation does not reflect. And what happens is the amount of reflected radiation right here goes down and the amount of absorbed radiation goes up. And that is a very important amplifier of global warming. And that's why we have this, this uh, Arctic amplification, which Budiko talked about way back in the 50s before it was really observed. And that is, uh, we know that the Earth is warming about two to three times faster in the Arctic than it is elsewhere because of this effect. Now, the next person in this saga is Jewel Charney. Uh, Charney was an American scientist considered to be the father of modern meteorology. Uh, he was not really a climate guy. He was a weather prediction guy. He made fundamental contributions in, in numerical weather prediction. He also was a driving force behind many national and international weather initiatives and programs. He was very highly respected in the meteorology world. And in 1979, when the National Research Council concluded it was time to convene a, a group to study CO2 and climate, they chose Charney to chair that committee. And the resulting publication, usually referred to as the Char Charney Report, is considered to be a landmark event in the modern scientific, scientific assessment of global warming and climate change. In fact, we just recently had the 40th anniversary of the Charney Report back in 2019, and a lot of, lot of uh, you know, events around that. It was such a big deal. And one of the really amazing things that came out, out of that is how accurate they were able to predict the warming. Back in 79, um, from 79 to, to 2019, 40-year period, this is the blue curve here is how the Earth's temperature is, is evolved. The red curve is how the CO2 has gone up. They predicted pretty closely how well this, how much the CO2 is going to go, go up. And they also were almost right on in predicting how much the Earth was going to warm over that 40-year period. This is the amount of warming predicted in the Charney report for that 40 year period. And this is how much the earth warmed. If you run a, a trend line through this, it pretty much matches up right on with the Charney Report's prediction of 0.8 degrees centigrade warming over that 40 year period. Realized back in 1979, computers were much uh, less capable than they are now. Climate models were very crude. They were just kind of coming into, into development back then. So they had very crude models, uh, didn't have all the great observing systems we have now and satellites and all that. And yet, Charney and his colleagues were able to predict very accurately how much the Earth warmed over that period. So I think that's very impressive. Now we come, of course, to Charles Keeling. Uh, I'm sure you recognize that name. He was an American scientist and professor of oceanography at Scripps right down here in San Diego. He was the first to make very accurate long-term measurements of atmospheric CO2, the first to establish that uh, the seasonal variations of CO2 as well as its long-term upward trend in what became known as the Keeling curve. Now, sometimes you see the Keeling curve as a smooth line, like this red line here, and sometimes you see it as a jagged line like that. When it's shown as a jagged line, they're simply displaying the seasonal cycle. CO2 uh, takes on a, a maximum in the spring and a minimum in the fall. It has to do with, you know, the, uh, and this is Northern Hemisphere, has to do with the, uh, the, the growing cycle. And, um, this data collection started by Keeling at Mauna Loa in Hawaii is the longest continuous record of atmospheric CO2 in the world. It's continuing on. And whenever you see the words Mauna Loa, think of Charles Keeling. He started it. And you can see here uh, Keeling received the National Medal of Science, the highest award for scientific achievement from President George W. Bush. So where is all this CO2 coming from? Well, before we get to that, let's just talk a little bit about the historical uh, flow here. Pre-industrial, you know, the CO2 levels were about 280 parts per million, and now we're well above 400, around 415 parts per million. That's an increase of almost 50% over the pre-industrial level. 
from 1850 to 2018, the total amount of CO2 emitted by human activities amounted to about 1.6 trillion tons, 1.6 trillion tons. And this increased the CO2 in the atmosphere by about 0.9 trillion tons. We're putting CO2 into the atmosphere a little more than twice as fast as the natural carbon cycle can take it out. And that's why we're getting this increase here. The current rate of CO2 emissions in the atmosphere as a result of human activities is about 40 billion tons per year. So where's all that CO2 coming from? Well, here's a plot of uh, annual CO2 emissions as, as by country as in terms of percent. And clearly the world's leader is China. The United States is number two. If you combine the US and China those two countries account for more than 40% of global CO2 emissions. And then it's India, Russia, Japan, on, and on down the list. Another way of looking at it is per capita CO2 emissions. And of course, the way you do that is you take the total emissions from a country and divide by the number of people in the country. Well, there's a lot of people in China and they drop way down the list and we float up to the top here. We're number one on a per capita basis by far. Although Australia and Canada are kind of right up there with us. And then there's a pretty big drop down here. So Canada, Australia, United States have the highest by far uh, per capita emissions of CO2. It's actually a good story for California. California's per capita carbon footprint is only 9.2 tons per person per year, which is significantly better than the US national average of 16.5. That puts us down here somewhere between Japan and Germany. Now there's a third way of looking at this, and that's cumulative CO2 emissions from the pre-industrial era to the present time. And when you look at it that way, the US really sticks out like a, like a sore thumb. You know, we have really, in terms of the cumulative CO2 emissions, it's coming from the US. You know, we've, we've, we've put the most out there by far. China's down below us by a factor of about two. Russia's is in third place, and then it goes on down from there. So think about this <clears throat> from a policy standpoint. Imagine you're a small country in uh, Micronesia, Tonga or something like that, and, and uh, you're seeing your, your, your country disappear because of rising sea levels. And by the way, sea levels are rising about three times faster in that part of the world compared to the, to the global average. You're seeing your uh, country disappear. And you're realizing that, you know, the United States is the ones who put all the CO2 in the atmosphere and the United States and China, Russia, you know, we, we didn't, we didn't do it. You know, we didn't put any CO2 in, but yet we're, we're bearing the brunt of that. So shouldn't these countries that put more of the CO2 in there pay more to solve this problem? Shouldn't they be on board? I mean, that's certainly an argument that I think uh, plays out, you know, in, in when we have these, you know, the Paris Climate Accord and things like that, something to be aware of. So uh, in terms of the US greenhouse gas emissions, um, it looks like this. By far, the, the most uh, of the greenhouse gases that we're emitting is in fact carbon dioxide. And when you cast the other gases in terms of, of CO2 equivalent, you find they're pretty low. Methane's down at 10%, nitrous oxide at 7%, and the fluorinated gases, thankfully, because they're very powerful, is way down here at 3%. So the dominant greenhouse gas being emitted in the US is in fact CO2, and it's coming mainly from these three uh, sectors. Number one is transportation. Number two is electrification of the power grid. And number three is industry. This is actually quite a different picture from the rest of the world. And the rest of the world, transportation is actually pretty low. It's only about 12%, and agriculture is much higher. Uh, electricity generation and industry are about the same. But we Americans just drive a lot compared to the rest of the world, and our agriculture production is, is pretty low compared to in terms of the, of the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the industry part is mainly steel and cement production. So I had to uh, pick one final person in this uh, saga. I wanted to pick someone who was still alive. And uh, of course, there's a lot of names you could choose from, a lot of people, but I think I made a pretty good choice here in picking James Hansen. Now, James Hansen was an American scientist who headed the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies from 81 to 2013. He led teams at NASA that pioneered the development and use of global temperature analyses and computer models to understand global warming and climate change, ushering in the modern era of climate science. I, I kind of see 
Hansen as a transitional figure for bringing us into the modern era of climate science. His 1988 congressional testimony was a landmark event that broadly introduced the problem of climate change to America's political leaders and the American people. He's also well known for his climate activism, serving as a role model for many other scientists in this regard. You've probably seen me show this, this before. I'm going to show it again. It's the uh, surface temperature anomaly from 1880 to 2018. Uh, this came from Hansen and his group. This is, this is called the GIST temp product, and it was produced by Hansen and his group. Let's just let it run here. And we're looking at temperature anomaly for starting in the 1800s. Uh, dark orange is plus 2 degrees centigrade. Dark blue is, is minus uh, 2 degrees centigrade. And uh, this is a, a really good way of illustrating what's, what's been going on. You can see, you know, some things we talk about. The land is warming faster than the ocean. The, the farther you go north, the more it's warming. You have an ar Arctic amplification. It's not warming everywhere. There's an area of, of cooling right here. There's areas of cooling right here. These have to do with changes in ocean circulation as, as the planet warms. It's a big chain. There's a big variation in how much the U.S. is warming. Here in the West, we've seen a lot of warming. If you live down in Florida in the Southeast, you haven't seen very much. You know, what global warming? Uh, if you live over here in Siberia, you've, you've seen a huge amount. If you live in, in Alaska, you've, see, you've seen a huge amount. So there's a lot of variation, you know, over, over space here. Well, you can thank James Hansen and his group for this, this wonderful product, which took an enormous effort to produce, you know. This was based on uh, probably two or three billion observations over land and about 350 million observations over the sea. All that data had to be processed and analyzed and carefully quality controlled and, and, uh, and to produce this product. And it was really a, an important contribution. And Hansen was also, and his group were also uh, very instrumental in bringing uh, climate modeling into the fray. So let's talk about climate models. We often mention climate models. I want to talk a little in more detail what a climate model is all about and what climate model prediction is all about. What is a climate model? Well, it's just a big program. It's just a big computer, computer program. It's a big app. It's an app. But it's an enormous app. You know, it's going to be millions of lines of code. It typically um, would be, have been developed by about a dozen people over about a 10-year period and um, has to run on a supercomputer. It requires a huge amount of computing power. And what you do basically is you lay out a grid over, this, over the earth. <clears throat> and at each grid point, a grid point is the intersection of these lines here, and they have the grid both horizontally and also vertically. At each line, at each grid point here, you're solving um, the equations of, of physics, chemistry, and biology the basic fundamental equations there and making forecasts forward in time. Uh, typical grid resolutions back in the mid, uh, you know, around 2015 when, you know, um, uh, these class of models were coming into play was about one or two degrees of latitude longitude with about 30 or 40 uh, levels in the atmosphere and the ocean about a one degree latitude longitude grid with about 30 to 60 levels in, in the vertical. And all these processes, such as the biology of, of forest and the biology of, of, uh, of um, you know, phytoplankton and the way that gas is transferred from the atmosphere to the ocean and that sort of thing, the effect of volcanoes, that's all incorporated in these models. So there's a huge amount of, of, of computing that has to go on in each of these grid nodes. Now, you're always wanting to make the grid nodes closer together, give you higher resolution. It's like a digital picture. The, the, the more you grid nodes you can have, it's like having a sharper digital picture, more megapixels. You get a clearer picture of what's going on. But you're limited by computer power. And then, of course, as the computers are getting more ever more powerful, you're able to improve the models, go to higher resolution, represent the physics more accurately here and all of that. So you may ask the question, OK, great. What's, what's the best climate model? It's, what's it saying? Well, there is no one clearly best climate model. Uh, and that's because every modeling group makes cert has to make certain assumptions about numerical techniques, about the way physics is represented. Uh, there's no disagreement about the basic uh, fundamental equations, but the way in which they're implemented on a numerical grid, there are some assumptions that have to be made. And so there's a range of, of approaches there. And so the fact that there is no one clearly best model, the IPCC uses the, um, the ensemble approach. 
Now the ensemble approach is rather than using just one sin single model, you use uh, a group of models or so-called ensemble. And the IPC for the um, uh, last assessment report used uh, a group of about 30 or 40 of these models. And of course they're carefully tested and accredited models. And these models were developed in about a dozen different countries. So now would be a good time to talk about the famous question that always comes up. You know, if you can't even predict the weather next week, how can you predict the climate 100 years from now? I, you know, I, I just don't buy that. You know, I'm, I'm a climate skeptic guy here and I'm saying, they can't tell me it's gonna rain next Thursday. How can you tell me what the climate is going to be 100 years from now? That's ridiculous. Well, I, I want to arm you a little bit with uh, arguments to go back against that kind of thinking. First of all, fundamentally, you have to realize that weather and climate are different, two different animals. What is climate? Climate is the long-term average of weather in any given location. Long-term defi is, is defined as 30 years, so it's the 30-year average of weather in a location. Well, if you're the climate denying guy, you're going to say, well, come on now, if you can't predict the weather, you know, 100 years from now, how can you predict the long-term average of the weather? What were you guys talking about? <coughs> well, I've come up with an analogy. I'm going to try out on you, and we'll see how it works. And it's kind of like this. Weather to climate is like the movement of specific individual cars on the highway to traffic. You know, climate is the long-term average of weather, and traffic is the long-term average of cars moving on, on, on the highway. So I want you to think now, I'm picturing your mind, uh, the overpass at MGN Parkway near REI over uh, Highway 1 South. Now imagine the cars moving along there at noon tomorrow, say Highway 1 South. And I give um, you the following problem. I'm going to say pick, pick out 10 people and give you the following problem. I want you to predict the make, model, and color of, a, of the car that's going to pass under that overpass going south on Highway 1 at one minute uh, into the future from noon. I, at noon, I want you to tell me one minute in the future what, what car is going to go under there. And then I want you to tell me two minutes in the future, three minutes in the future, four minutes, all the way out to 10 minutes in the future. I want you to forecast the make, model, and color of that car. <coughs> so 10 of you um, get together and decide how you're going to do that. Well. Um, you go out there and you notice that the cars are moving about 60 miles an hour. You know, most cars are moving about 60 miles an hour on the highway there. Realizing that 60 miles an hour is one mile a minute. For the person who has to do the one minute forecast, you're going to go about one mile up the highway. And precisely at noon, you're going to observe what car is passing. And that's going to be your forecast. For the person that's make the two minute forecast, you're going to two miles up the highway and so forth. So the person that's making the 10-minute forecast is going to go 10 miles up the highway, observe that car passing at noon, and say, that's my forecast of what car is going to pass there at um, 10 minutes into, at past noon. <clears throat> and then we look at the results. Well, nobody's going to be perfect, but you're going to see as, as the forecast time gets larger, the forecast skill is going to go down. In fact, as you get out to that 10-minute forecast, you may be way off because, you know, cars speed up and slow down over that 10-mile period. Some cars might exit in Castroville and not even show up at all. Generally speaking, the longer you're trying to forecast out, the, the less accurate your forecast. Pretty soon, your forecast is going to be totally useless, where you, you can just roll the dice and you're going to be just as good as what you're trying to predict there. Well, that's the weather prediction problem. You're trying to predict specific events. You can think of each car passing the overpass as like a specific weather event. And the time for which you can forecast that is very limited. That's the weather prediction problem. But here's the climate prediction problem. The climate prediction problem is trying to predict the traffic on Highway 1. Traffic is the long-term average, long-term in this case being defined as an hour, but the yeah, hour average of, of the cars passing there. And guess what? I can make a very accurate long-term prediction on traffic right now. I can tell you that the traffic is going to show an upward trend between now and summer. It's going to show an upward trend over the course of the summer. Why? Because we're getting behind the pandemic, getting the pandemic behind us. Tourism is starting to come back to Monterey. People are starting to travel more. There's going to be a steady upward trend in traffic on Highway 1. And I'm making that prediction months in advance, and I predict that it'll be accurate. That's what you're trying to do in climate prediction. You're not worrying about individual cars passing, individual weather events. You're talking about a long-term trend. 
And if you understand the external forcing of that long-term trend, in this case, it's uptick in tourism, uh, then you can make these very accurate long-term forecasts. So next time you are confronted with this climate change denier, try that, try that out and see how it goes. Now, of course, the ultimate way of, of proving these models are useful is you got to test them. And to do that, we do something called hind casting. Hind casting works like this. You've, you've got information that goes back in time. We have a pretty accurate representation of the surface temperature of the Earth going all the way back to 1880. <clears throat> so we can go back to 1880 with our model and pretend we're doing a forecast from 1880 up to the present time. We're going to treat it just like we were doing a forecast in the present time, but we're going to do it starting in 1880. And we know the answer. And so we'll see how well our model does against that answer. And that's what we're looking at here. Um, the solid line is the observed uh, surface temperature of the Earth. It goes up like that. The uh, uh, gray line here is, is the ensemble mean of 42 models from CMIP-5. Now, CMIP-5 was the coupled models intercomparison project version 5. And that is, those, those models, there's about 40 of them, 45 or so, those models really drove um, the information in the IPCC um, AR5 report, the assessment report 5, which we're all pretty familiar with. That's what pretty much all discussions these days are based on. There's a new modeling thing coming along. It's called CMIP-6. CMIP-6 is going to have 100 models, as opposed to here where we had about 45. CMIP-6 CMIP will have 100 models, a couple modeling in a comparison project version 6. And of course, these models are, are higher resolution and are more advanced because the computers are more powerful and you know, we understand the physics better. All those things are better models. And, and so here's how those two things played out. And you can see both the, the CMIP-5 and CMIP-6 models were pretty in pretty close agreement. And they do an excellent job of showing where, you know, we, we've done a 140 year forecast and the ensemble mean of both those modeling groups come within, you know, just a, a fraction of a degree from the real answer. This shaded area is the range of results, but the ensemble mean really does a great example or a great um, a job here. I'm going to finish with one final thing, and that is uh, I want to uh, clue you in on something which is pretty late breaking, and it's uh, it's concerning. I'm going to raise. Um, I'm going to raise the um, concern flag. I'm not prepared to raise the uh, alarm flag. I'm not prepared. I'm going to I'm going to ring the concern bell. I'm not prepared to ring the alarm bell, but I'm going to ring the concern bell because what's been happening is I've been reading about this lately, and that is um, some preliminary results are coming out from the CMIP six uh, modeling exercise, and the, the last results I saw was based on 40 model runs, 40 out of ultimately 100. And what they were showing was these models were showing a greater ECS, equilibrium climate sensitivity, than the older models, and, and which means they were starting to show more warming. If that result holds up and um, the other models in the CMIP-6 group uh, hold up and show that same result, we're going to find that all the IPC predictions for uh, where we're going to be at the end of the century are going to be revised upward. And that means we're going to have a, 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 a harder, a higher hill to climb uh, to get to where we need to be. And that's not gonna be a good, a good uh, outcome. Um, how much more? Well, maybe half a degree centigrade, that's pretty significant. Why is this happening? Well, it's still an area of active research, but um, the, um, so far what they're seeing, it seems to be related to uh, clouds and cloud feedback which I label, label here as a, a future tipping point. Now, clouds are complicated. And, um, you know, if you talk to a climate modeler back in the 80s, they would tell you what's well, the biggest uncertainty we have. We just don't know what, how these clouds are going to behave. If you talk to climate modelers in the 2000s, they'd say, well, we think they're pretty, not, a, not much of a problem. They're pretty neutral. Uh, so we're not really too concerned about clouds. And, and clouds are, are complicated in the following way. High clouds, exert a warming effect like cirrus clouds we see they exert a warming effect because the sun pretty much goes right through them but they trap the outgoing infrared radiation low clouds low stratus like we have off the coast of monterey all the time in the summer they exert a cooling effect 
if you ever been in a plane fleeing leave a monorail and it's, it's all foggy you take off you can't see anything all of a sudden you break out into above the clouds you look down it's really white and it's just you got to put your sunglasses on well that's because they're reflecting all that sun sunlight going back out to space they exert a, a strong cooling effect mid-level clouds are kind of neutral well what they've been seeing <coughs> tend to be, to be seeing in these models is that they are showing a greater sensitivity the, the low level clouds are tending to show a greater sensitivity than previously thought to the warming earth and this kind of illustrate this is an extreme case but what you would be seeing as the earth gets warmer and warmer you would go from you know thick clouds here to less clouds and that you know allows the sun to come through hit the ocean warm the earth if that result holds up um, then like i said that's not going to be a positive result and it's going to be um, uh, 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 something of concern because it's going to tell us that we've got to even bear down harder to get to where we need to be. So in summary, uh, climate science has been around for a long time and is a mature field. Long before there were satellites, computer models, or even computers, scientists understood that the huge increase in the burning of fossil fuels that began with the industrial revolution would lead to a warming earth and a changing climate. Indeed, the basics of the greenhouse effect, global warming and climate change have been understood for over 100 years. And uh, it's important to acknowledge the contributions that that uh, people we talked about this evening made. That would be Joseph Fourier, Eunice Newton Foote, John Tyndall, uh, Sante Arrhenius, Milutin Milankovic, Guy Stewart Calendar, Jewel Charney, Mikhail Budiko, Charles Keeling, and James Hansen. So that's it. I'm going to, now going to stop the screen sharing and open it up to questions and discussion. Happy to take your questions or engage in some discussion. Mike, yeah. um, I'm just I'm concerned about the timing of solutions. We need to start really quickly and do you see are you optimistic that we can do that well you know the the ipcc just came out with their their sort of annual report card um uh, this past fall <clears throat> and they said basically we're on track for three degrees of warming and you recall of course the climate uh, or the paris accord was hoping for two degrees or less hopefully 1.5 well as of this past fall we're on we're on track for three degrees of warming I'm optimistic that we can do a little bit better than that. I think we can do um, maybe take it down to 2.5, but I don't think we're doing much better than 2.5. Um, and the only reason I have that optimism is because, uh, you know, the United States is turning things around. We've, we're rejoining the, the, the Paris Accord, and that's we're starting to show some leadership again, and that will spur other countries to to make to make uh, the kinds of commitments they need to make. So I think we can do better than where we are currently on track, but not by very much. Uh, do you want to, can you say something about the timing of, of taking action? Well, uh, you know, the sooner the better, <laughs> you know, you know, I, I, you know, I say that, you know, it, it's never too late to do something, but you want to start as soon as possible. And of course, the general uh, plan, the general plan that's been laid out is we get to carbon neutral by 2050. And we get to pretty much carbon zero by by the end of the century and carbon carbon zero means pretty close to zero emissions carbon neutral means we're emitting no more than the natural world is able to take and um you know that's going to be a pretty heavy lift um i am optimistic about the technology i am optimistic about um uh, the younger generation and their commitment to make things happen i am optimistic about the fact that the u.s is rejoining the paris accord but um the fact of the matter is it's a heavy lift to get to where we need to be from here Mm -hmm. How is the uh, the promise for carbon sequestration today compared to 10 years ago? Are you more optimistic about that as a part of the solution? I neutral? think it's going to be a part of the solution, but I don't necessarily think it's going to be, you know, a huge part of the solution. I think the carbon sequestration is going to probably come into play mainly in con context of industrial production. We're still going to need steel. We're still going to need concrete. And that we've got to, we've got to capture that carbon that's coming from those production processes and, and sequester that. And I think that's where the main focus is going to be. But ultimately, we're going to be getting away from burning of fossil fuels for electrification of the power grid and, and, is, and cars. 
is there more going on now than 10 years ago? In other words, for wherever carbon sequestration is going to be in industry, you're saying, has I, that, I, you know, I haven't is that seen moving? It. I haven't no? seen it happen, <clears throat> happening, but that doesn't mean it isn't happening. Okay. By the way, I strongly recommend the Bill Gates book. I know, um, I don't know if you guys have read that yet or not, but uh, it's really pretty good. You know, he's he's a he's a self-confessed techno geek, but he's also a very practical businessman, and he approaches right. it from a practical business standpoint. And I think he's got a lot of good ideas in there. I bet Doug Winger has a question. No, I was just going to say that was fascinating to see how the how the work kept building mm -hmm. on the shoulders of the people who had come before. And, Absolutely. And, you know, and, and that's just a, a few of the highlights. You know, I'm sure there's there's really thousands of people. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you know, there are there are thousands of scientists right now working in this field. And I had to pick one, so I picked James Hansen. And I think I think it was a pretty good choice. But the fact of the matter is there are thousands of people working now. And and actually, one thing I wanted to mention, we've we've transitioned over the period I talked about here from kind of the period in the 1800s where it was you know individual solo practitioners. You had Arrhenius doing all this stuff and you had John Tyndall doing this stuff. Now we're in the era of big science, you know, individuals don't really by themselves do that much. It's, it's a big team effort. In fact, it's a global team effort. And, um, you know, it's how, how the whole team puts together because you're talking about, you know, hundreds of computer models and, and satellite systems and, and you know, big expeditions to the Arctic and things like that. So we've gone from the era of sort of individual science to the era of big science. And, and that's kind of where we are right now. Yeah. Also, I'd like also, to Sorry, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, uh, along those lines, I'd like to compliment you on how well you pronounced all their names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was pretty I, I, used, I used actually, I think I used I used um, Google Translate <laughs> to get the correct pronunciations for some of the Swedish and Serbian names. That's right. <laughs> I and wanted other, to also uh, comment on the fact that elections really do matter because we backslid for four years. We now are benefiting from a, an administration that gets it. Yeah, you know, President Biden you know, has asked Congress for two trillion dollars over four years for climate. Yeah, right. A lot, and of course, a lot of it's going to happen in the infrastructure bill, which is really good. Speaking of infrastructure, you know, where do we need to go on infrastructure with regard to climate? Well. You know the elect we got a, the electric power grid. We're going to have to at least double the electric power grid. You know, a big part of what you have to do is electrify everything we can. <laughs> well, even if we had the electricity source now, we couldn't put it on the grid. It's not it's not big enough. We need to basically at least double, maybe even triple the capacity of of the electric power grid and make it a lot more robust than it is. We need to we need to continue to bring on um, clean energy, wind and solar about three to five times faster than we're bringing on now. That's kind of what we need to do to get to where we need to be. And I'm hoping, you know, those are the kind of things I do believe will be in the, in, in the infrastructure bill. And I thought one of the most fascinating things was the, the section that you did showing the ice age cycles and, you know, and what, what really drives those. And then the fact that we're, uh, it was pretty dramatic that we're really that we should be in a in a generally cooling cycle right now and we're going dramatically right now warming. yeah I, I always like to begin most of my talks with that to kind of show the context of where we're at you know for the last million years we've been in this hundred thousand year ice age cycle and the way that works is we're in a warm period for about uh twenty thousand years and right now we're twelve thousand years into that warm period so under normal circumstances, 8,000 years from now, we'd start into the really rapid decline. And that takes about 10,000 years to go from there down all the way to the ice age takes about 10,000 years. Then you're in the ice age for about 60,000 years. And then it takes about 10,000 years to come back out to the next warm period. And by the way, you know, the warm period we're in now is called the Holocene warm period. But a lot of people have looked at that red spike on my graph there and said, we're entered, we've entered a new period. It's called the, we, we want to call it the Anthropocene. Anthropocene. Yeah. Anthropocene. Yes. Where, men, where humans are, are really controlling the situation. Cool group. Cool group. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Lee, Lee has a question. Uh, Mike, thanks. Um, that, that was fabulous, incidentally. Um, you know, we've talked about this before, but your 
uh, all of us, but your chart brought uh, the, the one chart I'm going to mention brought this back to, to mind, and that was the chart where you talked about the contributors towards the carbon mm -hmm. footprint, whether it might be energy production, transportation, agriculture, yeah. and so forth and so on. And you mentioned that it varies from country to country, mm -hmm. which ones affect uh, have more effect in different countries. But if we just start with the proposition that we have a, a finite uh, number of dollars, for example, to approach the, the mm -hmm. this issue, where do we get the most bang for our buck? Is it in getting more people into electric cars? Is it in uh, changing the electrification system? Is it amending agricultural practices in third world countries? Uh, where, 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 where do we get the most effect? Well, in terms of the U.S., I'm going to focus on the U.S. first. Uh, you know, we really need to, and Bill Gates talks about this quite a bit in his book, we really need to electrify everything we possibly can and then power the electric grid with, with um, either renewables, renewables, you know, something that's not greenhouse gas emitting. And to do that, <clears throat> as I mentioned a minute ago, we got a double of, at least double, maybe triple the capacity of the electric grid. It's just not, it just doesn't have the cap capacity to do it now. <clears throat> and we have to make it more robust. And we have to make the transition from gasoline, power transportation to electric vehicles. And that, that's all happening. And we need to bring on the, the green energy, you know, faster. Part of that involves battery storage. I mean, we need to bring on battery storage capabilities. And it's not, as Bill Gates talked about in the book, it's not just day night. We need long-term storage. We need to be able to, you know, save up the, the uh, you know, solar energy from the summertime and, and play it back in the wintertime. So we need long-term battery storage as well. So um, those kinds of things, I think, I think the technology is pretty well known and, and it's, it's really, you know, it's uh, coming along quite well. I mean, the price of, of solar panels continues to go down. It's almost like computer chips, it just keeps going down mm -hmm. and down. And there doesn't seem to be necessarily any um, reason to think it isn't gonna keep on going down, which is really good. Um, the, um, I, 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 Here's an interesting food for thought here that live here in this beautiful part of the world. Um, <clears throat> you know, offshore wind, if, if you look at the, at the, um, at the uh, um, wind resource for California, you know, you're talking about where we're gonna put the windmills, look at the wind resource for California, there's maps of that, you know, people have worked that out. Well, by far, the most wind resource is right along the California coast, right out there in the ocean. And, the, uh, you know, because the wind is very consistent out there, it's always blowing pretty much. And, oh, by the way, the offshore wind turbines can be made to be much more efficient than the ones on shore because they may be huge. They, the wind turbines that are offshore are just huge compared to the ones that are onshore. The main reason is because you can transplate, transport the blades by ship. You can't transport them on the highways. They're too big, but you can transport them by ship. You can bring that ship in and you can put up a huge wind turbine off the coast of Big Sur. Now, are we going to want that? You know, a lot of people are going to say, wait a minute, what are you going to do? You want to look at it. Beautiful scenery off of natural scenery off of Big Sur. A lot of people will say, I see that wind turbine out there and I think it's a beautiful sight because I know it's clean energy and this is a wonderful thing. And other people will say, I don't want to see anything but the natural environment. So I think that's going to become a big issue, particularly here in California going forward. So how many miles are you talking about off offshore? Within sight. You know, certainly within oh. sight, oh, and, okay. and 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 of course, there's always environmental impact too because you've got to you've got to put you know material on the sea floor and you've got to build this build this you know uh, wind turbine out there and you've got to have a power cable that runs from mm -hmm. onshore on shore, and there are there are offshore wind turbines in Europe you know <laughs> they're doing fine, right off uh, uh, Trump's uh, golf course. I think that's an <laughs> interesting question. Yeah, how does that work with uh, like you know marine protected areas too? With, exactly. Uh, exactly. There's a lots of political yeah. issues that lots of policy matters are going to going to come into play there. And then there's the the Monterey Bay Canyon. <laughs> yeah. Um, anchoring something there would be quite a feat. Yeah, you could do it there, but you know you'll you'll do it <clears throat> pretty close to shore off California because it drops off so fast. Mm -hmm. But you know the the, uh, the solar you know I, I, here's an interesting thing I learned. <clears throat> you know, California is number one in solar. We lead the country in solar. We're number five in, in wind. Mm -hmm. And we produce so much solar now in the summertime. We, we have to give it away. 
we not only do we sell it away, we don't just give it away we pay states to take it off our hands mm. that's true the guy from pg and told me that we pay states to take our excess electricity in the summertime and guess what they do with it they turn around and sell it back to us at nighttime <laughs> not good <laughs> so that's that's the importance of the battery storage capabilities and then as you probably know there's that big thing going on at moss landing the the battery, battery energy storage system at Moss Landing, which is currently um, uh, 12 megawatt hours of storage capacity and 300 megawatts of transmission capacity, is the largest battery energy storage in the world. And it's, it's getting bigger. It's going to go to 1,600 megawatt hours here by August. And that's just the, the Vistra Energy part. There's a, there's a PG&E initiative out there, too. They're, they're partnered with Tesla. They're going to add more to it. So, um, you know, that's that's really fantastic. And oh, by the way, the world, one of the world's, perhaps the world's largest solar array, it's called Topaz, exists right down in San Luis Obispo County, not that far from us. It's the world's, mm. it's one of the world's largest areas. But Mike, the energy that's being sold back to us, is that generated by fossil fuel? We don't really know. You know, I asked that question, the BGNA guy, and he said, we can't really tell. You know, it's it's just on the grid and we can't really guarantee that it's that it's you know green energy or not you know it'd be good if we can kind of be self-contained and generate all our solar energy and keep it here in california yeah yeah and, and is there a comparable facility anywhere else in the country com compared uh, comparable to the one at moss landing i'm sure there are other storage facilities but they're not nearly as big the one out there is is really huge and it's getting mm -hmm. bigger it's 1200 megawatts now it's going to be um 1600 megawatts by August, and they've got room to keep on growing. If, if the if the um, if the um, uh, you know the business case is made for it. Well, you know, you know, a real issue on electric cars is the raw materials for the batteries and whatnot. And so, uh, you know, that's that's a that's a huge issue. It's a it's a it's a yeah. pinch point for a lot of the manufacturers and whatnot yeah. to be concerned about that. And so, I'm I'm trying to get my hands wrapped around this concept that Bill Gates, I guess, talked about uh, that you'd have batteries large enough to literally store power during the summer when you have plenty of sunlight and whatnot that would get you through the winter. I can't even imagine the scale of <laughs> raw material for that battery. Uh, yeah, well, you think about batteries, there's different battery technologies and the battery technology that like you put at Moss Landing or try to do that storage from winter to summer summer to winter is um, not the same battery technology you have in a car. You know, in a car you have a lithium ion battery and because it has to be light, you know. But you know, the battery storage at Moss Landing can be lead acid, it can be other technology that's that's much cheaper and you can you know bring it to scale to to do that kind of storage. Oh by the way, here's a fun thing to think about. When we eventually make the transition to everybody has electric vehicles, uh, your electric vehicle is going to become an important part of the storage system because sure. what's going to happen is yeah. you're going to have free electricity during the day right. so you're going to have free charging of your car and rather than shooting that electricity off to arizona and paying arizona to take it you know whatever it's going to go into your car and all in hundreds of thousands of other cars so your 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 vehicles will actually be part of the storage system sure you got a power wall and four wheels right exactly right. Uh, yeah. people have power walls in their garages as well right and then I guess in, in all of this technology, you've also got to crank in the carbon footprint of what it takes to put in those windmills. And yes, that's, that's a good there. question. That came up in one of my early talks, and someone said, "Well, you know, there's so much steel in there, and they're giant. They're giant. It actually, you know, their carbon footprint is is you know, it takes more, puts more carbon in the atmosphere to build a damn windmill than it's going to save over the course of its lifetime." Well, that's, that's not true. I can't possibly be true. In about 50 studies. And it turns out it's about a 20, if you average over all the different windmills, different sightings and different sizes and everything, it, it's about a 20 to one ratio. You know, you, wow. you actually save about 20 times as much carbon going to the atmosphere by operating a windmill in a year life cycle mm -hmm. than it costs in carbon to reproduce it. So in other words, yeah, it, it, it typically lasts about 20 years. The first year of operation, you're kind of paying back the carbon footprint to build a windmill. In the next 19 years, it's all to the good. Mm. One interesting yeah. thing, you know, it was talked about in the, in the Bill Gates book, and I and I had to, you know, really kind of change my thinking a little bit on that. Is nuclear power? 
Now he's a little bit biased because he owns a nuclear company that's developing a, a nuclear technology. But you know the the current nuclear power plants are the vast majority of them are are called second generation plants. Mm -hmm. A handful of third generation plants. Third generation plants are not very different from the second generation plants. They're you know just kind of incremental improvements. But there is now on the drawing board fourth generation plants. And in fact, there have been a couple of of, of research reactors developed. There's about a half a dozen different designs for the so-called fourth generation uh, plants. And they significantly mitigate the problems of nuclear power that we live with today. I'm not going to say they eliminate it. I don't think they eliminate it completely, but they do significantly uh, mitigate the problems. So I'm not excluding the possibility of nuclear power being a, a, a player here. China has, I think China may be the only country that has announced their intentions to field a fourth generation plant operationally. They're hoping to do that by the end of this decade. Or maybe even two of them, they're based on thorium rather than uranium. And there are a couple other designs that are, you know, at least being talked about. And, and uh, in some cases they've had small test reactors built. So nuclear may become part of the solution as well. What's the uh, waste disposal for a thorium reactor like compared to the old ones? It's not as bad. You know, the, 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 like I said, it mitigates the problem. You know, one of the big problems with current generation is what do you do with the waste? And there's waste in all these fourth generation designs, but generally it's not as radioactive for as long. And so the storage problem is, is less. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they're not as prone to being able to be exploited for <coughs> weapons proliferation, but not completely independent of that. They're inherently safer designs. Um, one thing they may not mitigate, though, is cost. It turns out that nuclear power is by far the most expensive mm -hmm. power on the grid. Mm -hmm. And these fourth generation designs may actually be even more expensive. I, I don't know. We'll just have to see how that plays out. When the nuclear industry decided what path they're going to go down, you know, back in the 60s, they decided to go down the uranium path, not the thorium path, mm -hmm. because the uranium breeding cycle is more more efficient than thorium and, it's, and it was it was a cheaper they figured it would be more cost effective well it's still the most most expensive power on the grid by far it costs about nine billion dollars to to implement a, a nuclear power plant it costs about a billion dollars to decommission it by the way we have only one nuclear power plant left in california and that's um the one down south uh, diablo canyon yeah, yeah. And yeah, and it's going to be decom it's going to be taken off service in about two years, I think, and, mm -hmm. and be decommissioned over about a ten year period. Mike, I've been listening to all of this. It's great, and and wishing we had a hundred people in the room uh, uh, to hear it. Well, I'll put I'll put it up on YouTube, and then maybe we can send it out to everybody. We will send it out for Help sure. Help this group of people how we can can individually. Take it to several more people. Can can they? Um, will you have it here in a way that we can all that we're here access it? Some? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll have a YouTube link and I'll email it to you, and you can email it to other people, and they can email it to everybody right. too. And we'll do that. And we'll do it. Really try and do that because this was um, uh, like nothing else they'll ever find. Quite a resource. It was terrific. It was wonderful, Mike. Thank, Thank you. I appreciate that. I had fun giving it. Thank you. Really, it was really, really it was really terrific. I learned something all the time. Yeah. Okay, very good. Well, I'm gonna yeah. say goodbye to everyone and, and thanks so much for coming. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Good night. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Night all. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Linda. Take care. <laughs>